Okay, so we begin the master class. Once again, a very warm welcome to our master class on journalism. Uh, the topic for today's session is news uh, consumption and fact checking. Uh, this session is being taken up by Dr. Harsh Tanecha, who is an associate professor in the College of Media at University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign and is also the program mentor for journalism program at Geo Institute. He's joined today with his doctoral students, Sakshi Bhalla and Rick Ray from Institute of Communications Research at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, drawing on the latest research on news audiences, our speakers will present two original studies focused on India and the US to assess the effectiveness of fact-checking in practice. Through these studies, they shall explore how contemporary media context shape audiences' amenability to information and misinformation. Uh, before we begin the masterclass today, I would like to point, uh, point out that our audience can add their questions in the comment section below, and we shall take the questions uh, towards the end of the session. So without further ado, I would now like to welcome Dr. Harsh Taneja and request him to start the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Harshita. It's a <clears throat> pleasure to be, you know, doing this masterclass and that to a masterclass related to the journalism program for GEO, <clears throat> which we hope will, you know, be a very successful and a very innovative program once it starts this June. But I am also very excited to be presenting with two of my doctoral students you know, studies that each of them have been leading on this very important topic. So, so what we'll do is that I'll sort of offer a few preliminary thoughts on more generally, like, you know, how we situate this problem of fact-checking, why do we need fact-checking, and what role sort of news media should play in a democracy and how that is panning out. And then Rick, followed by Sakshi, will actually take up their individual studies. And, you know, in the end, we'll open it up to questions which can be about what I presented. They can be about what each of them presented. So we'll make it more interactive at the end. So, so I want to sort of start with this, you know, very well-known, fairly obvious point, but I think one that needs more re-emphasis than ever is that, you know, for a democracy to function properly, citizens need to be well informed. We kind of know this, but if we think about it at a very basic level, voting is an informed choice. We need proper information about you know, who we elect or who we want to elect in order to, you know, make that choice and in order for that choice to work well for us. And the other part is that this exchange of information needs to be deliberative. In other words, we need to give people a chance to reason with each other, to discuss with each other, to debate with each other in order to make these informed choices which make democracy function. So with this big idea, you know, we, the academic conception of this idea is this concept of a public sphere. So for a democracy to function properly on the bedrock of information, you need sort of literally a place or a forum where ideas and information can be freely exchanged. And this place needs to be separate from the government and separate from the civil society. This needs to be a forum that sits between these institutions. And the ideal conception of this forum was given by this very eminent, you know, social scientist, one of the most influential social scientists of our times, Habermas, who basically conceptualized the public sphere 
as literally these physical spaces he was drawing on sort of his own you know context of western europe where literally like these coffee houses where people could come together and debate and discuss things until each of them is satisfied that they are well informed but we obviously also understand that you know this own conception has this conception of habermas is is an idealized version there are issues of access not you cannot really create a place where which everybody can access even if you were to create many such places physical spaces that everybody can access you still will have issues where certain people will have more of a voice than others so given this ideal version our hope sort of have has been that you know can the media specifically the news media function as the public sphere can they become those institutions that sit between the government and the civil society and help each of these sides provide a reasonable voice conduct the deliberation and in the end make each of us more informed for democracies to function but this sort of what we say is more like a normative theory of media or in other words our conception of how the media should function as a public sphere but what we are going to focus on today is more what we call the empirical study of media which is sort of this broad field of you know media and communications which is concerned with the central question of do media function as they should so when it comes to you know the empirical study of media we can roughly divide this into four areas so you know studies of production get into how are the media actually made so for news that would be who are the journalists and how do they gather and produce the news or the study of content itself so what is in on the media and so for journalism i would just give a very simple example of a question that okay why is the news much more about rich and powerful people rather than about ordinary people so that would be a content question and then we all know very well that you know as technology changes media changes a lot it changes the way in which the media is made it changes the way in which content is rendered and it changes the way in which media is distributed so we need to also study technologies and then finally one of the most important aspects of studying the media is who are the audiences what are how are they making their media choices how are they participating and and ultimately what is the media doing to them for example is showing too much violence having harmful effects on people so you know this is sort of broadly the type of research that tries to understand whether the media is really able to achieve what it should achieve and in the context of news media and journalism i would say the the central question is how do each of these empirical aspects enable the media to function as close to an ideal public sphere as we as it should so other studies here today will focus on the consumption side of the empirical study of media where we'll specifically focus on news consumption so before we delve into the specific studies we will present today if you think of the history of modern media <clears throat> and here i am only talking about the history of modern media since the advent of broadcasting if you wanted to go into a longer history of media there are many versions of it some people will start with the printing press but i would actually say that you know the 
invention of writing was the first big turn in the development of media followed by the printing press followed by the development of electronic media so these are in my view and not just my many historians of media will tell you that these are the three big points but we are concerned with the last phase of it which itself can be broken into three phases so if you think of media since the advent of broadcasting we had an era from about you know the 1930s 1940s up until about the late 1980s which we can call the broadcast era where everyone got the same news you had big television networks you had most markets having a couple of radio stations and one or two big newspapers so whoever had access to these mass media essentially got the same news even where you had multiple networks less for example the us traditionally had three broadcast networks you could say that the news was typically very similar across these channels it was mostly moderate it was if the media was public service then it tended to be a little more pro establishment less radical even even if you think of the commercial logics of it if you have only a limited number of outlets and they need to cater to the masses they will tend to be very moderate they will not tend to be radical but then since the late 1980s the advent of you know cable and satellite television we saw that the media options that could be provided to ordinary people increased a lot and what that one of the consequences of that is that basically a space got created for what we call as partisan news media or in other words news that is not moderate or neutral anymore news that does not necessarily cater to the middle view of the audiences but news that also can cater to more extreme ideologies and extreme tastes so in the us for example we have seen institutions like you know fox news msnbc that started this that is extremely conservative extremely liberal in india you see lot of you know right leaning left leaning news outlets on on television so this really started with cable television's ability to provide a lot of channels to the ordinary television home and what that has done on the news consumption side is that the media audience is quite fragmented what that means is that since we all have a lot of choices we have the ability to consume things that are very different from what everybody else is consuming according to our own ideology according to our own taste so if if i am a right leaning supporter then i'll probably only consume that consume news that appeals to my political ideology i'll ignore and block everything out so that has a tendency to polarize audiences but the other thing that increasing media choices have done is that we have seen an overall decline in news consumption so basically think about it when everybody was watching one doordarshan or the main television network then if you wanted to continue watching tv you had no choice but to watch the news at 9 o'clock if if you were you know reading the newspaper even if you read the newspaper only for sports but the front page would always have political news so you would at least see the headlines but that aspect stop you know that feature of a low choice media environment kind of stop directing people to news once you started having more choices and the third era which you know some scholars have called recently the post post broadcast democracy 
is is this era where we say that social media has become the locus of all media consumption including you know for news so in other words most people are no longer voluntarily tuning into the news whether it is on television whether it is online they are essentially using social media as a way to consume any information and the social media feeds are responsible for what news you consume and what news you don't consume and what this has also done is it has created immense financial struggles for news organizations across the globe newspaper companies are struggling digital first outlets have still not figured out how to make money so so basically we have an era where people have a lot of choice they have no incentive or no structure that automatically takes them to the news and news organizations are financially also struggling so this has created a whole lot of problems for news and in turn for the ability of news media to function as a public sphere so you know recently there was this article in guardian where prince harry said that you know online misinformation is a global humanitarian issue so what is happening is that just as social media have become the locus of all media consumption this is where we start and finish our media day news and misinformation compete and unfortunately i think misinformation seems to be winning that competition and what that has done is that the idea of audience polarization that we basically are restricted we only interact with information that appeals to our ideology we only interact with other people who share that ideology and we essentially block everything out we live in a bubble that that theory or that idea is becoming a real threat so in that you know my students and i like a lot of media and communication scholars think about how can we combat misinformation and that is where we've been doing some original studies on fact checking and trying to assess if fact checking really is a viable solution to this so with that i'll stop boring you guys and turn it over to them so that they can actually present to you some interesting original work and i see rick has requested control of my screen so over to you rick thank you all right so uh for the first study um let me just begin by prefacing like what do we understand by fact checkers and how are they different from traditional uh, news organizations so fact checkers are essentially uh, independent public facing organizations uh, who provide corrective information to misinformation or fake news that's uh, circulating through different media channels and even though uh, fact checking as a practice has been a core component of journalism throughout the years uh the practice of like independent fact checking organizations uh holding mm, control Oh, all right. So yeah, it gained prominence uh, during the early 2000s in the US with organizations such as factcheck.org, uh, Snopes, PolitiFact. And we also have a Pointer Institute, which is a nonprofit journalism school. And since the 2016 uh, US presidential election, they have formed this consortium of uh, fact checkers across the globe, uh, they call it the International Fact Checking Network. And there are actually uh, several Indian signatories to uh, the IFCN, including Boom, FactChecker.in, TV2Den Network, and formerly Alt News. 
And for this particular study, we uh, consider boom and alt news. So one of the key uh, fact denominators of uh, modern fact checking organizations is their mode of operation and they usually operate through digital channels and social media platforms. So that being said, um, what is our current understanding of who the audiences are for these fact checkers? Uh, several studies have shown that Corrective information is more effective and with liberal or left-leaning audiences, and they are just more amenable to corrective information. But uh, on the flip side, we also have uh, something that which we call the backfire effect. So it occurs when someone with a misperception on a particular topic uh, refuses to accept facts uh, when encountered with that corrective information. But it, it sometimes goes a bit further where when encountered with corrective information, uh, the previously held misperception actually gets strengthened. So uh, you may think about uh, something like if you are a very keen believer in Ayurveda and someone told you that it doesn't work uh, in dispelling uh, the coronavirus, but it sort of triggers that backfire effect in a person who is a very keen follower of our weather and they'll start questioning the motives of why uh, someone would push the agenda of coronavirus uh, vaccines. So uh, there have been uh, some studies that looks at, uh, experimental studies that looks at how we can uh, address this uh, belief in misperceptions and miscommunication. Um, so they found that the ability to identify misinformation uh, differs across your political leanings and attitudes, but such uh, media literacy, such uh, media literacy interventions uh, do not persist for long. So the effectiveness wanes over time. But while these were more uh, psychological aspects of uh, the effects of fact-checking on news audiences, uh, there are also several other uh, approaches to exploring why fact-checking might not be as effective. So a majority of uh, studies uh, focus on partisanship in political news, but later suggestions also point to the very low reach of fact checkers because they tend to be uh, niche media outlets and have a, a very low reach when you compare it against mainstream media, uh, media outlets and even uh, partisan online news organizations. And these niche media uh, suffer what we call as double jeopardy effects where uh, they get penalized twice because first they have a very low reach and then they also suffer from low engagement because the people who actually are going to follow such niche outlets, they have a wider upper choice of outlets. So they tend to be um, less loyal to one particular outlet. And similarly, uh, it's also used by people who are very heavy news users or media users in general. So our research questions are, are partisan news users on the left of the divide more likely to affiliate with fact checkers? And are these differences in how left and right leaning users engage with fact checkers? So uh, we focused a study on Twitter and we collected, so we had a total of 14 outlets across uh, the US and India. And 
we collected the data uh, using a custom script written in Python programming language, which interfaced with the Twitter API. And then it sent the request to the Twitter servers, which sent back the request, uh, sent back the response. And we uh, ended up with over 7 million uh, Twitter users uh, across 14 media outlets. And we also downloaded uh, over 50,000 replies to fact checks and over 100,000 retweets. And this data was collected between February of 2020 and March of 2021. So uh, we first did a descriptive clustering analysis. So just to give you a brief overview, uh, clustering analysis is essentially um, a technique to group entities based on a similarity metric. And for this particular study, we looked at the number of users, uh, the common users who follow the same outlets. So for the results, uh, you can see uh, for the India-based outlets uh, at a two-cluster solution that there, the I wouldn't exactly call it left-leaning, but uh, let's just say that more critical of BJP. So outlets such as Crawl, uh, Wire, as well as the fact-checking outlets, Alt News and Boom, they sort of form into their own cluster, whereas Op India and Swaraja actually form a different cluster. And we also see a similar thing for the US-based outlets where the left-leaning outlets and the fact-checking outlets form their own separate cluster, uh, whereas the right-leaning outlets form their own cluster. We then conducted uh, some uh, statistical analysis to estimate whether following of news outlets predicted uh, the following of fact-checkers whether following of uh, news and fact-checking outlets predicted retweeting fact-checks, and finally, whether following news and fact-checking outlets uh, predicted uh, replying to fact-checkers. So some of the key findings here is that what we found uh, following partisan news outlets uh, reduces the probability of following fact-checkers, but even there, there was a small difference. Uh, we found that right-leaning outlet followers were somewhat less likely uh, than left-leaning followers to follow fact-checkers. Then uh, we found that left-leaning outlet followers are more likely to retweet those fact-checks, whereas uh, right-leaning outlet followers were more or at least equally likely to reply. But the key thing to note here is that both retweeting and replying, so interacting with fact checkers on Twitter, were a very low volume activity limited to a small subset of partisan news users. So to sum up, uh, fact check exposure is quite limited, uh, and especially it is limited to users with uh, highest activity on the platform, uh, regardless of uh, how they identify and what their opinions, political leanings are. And there are some differences in how followers of left or right leaning outlets interact, but we do find that it is the followers of those specific fact checking outlets who are the most uh, likely to interact. And the patterns were actually consistent across uh, both those both of these countries. And to find like one final thing that I want to stress here is that uh, this is a constant attack against uh, fact checkers that they are they have this liberal bias, but we do not have much evidence to state the same and. This is often an artifact of just uh, more misinformation emerging from uh, right-leaning spaces. So accordingly, you would have much more fact checks that counter those misinformation. So that being said, uh, there is a big limitation because uh, we did not consider the specific content and context in this particular study. So that is where I would ask uh, Sakshi to take over.
So, hi everyone. Uh, Professor Taneja and Rick have shown us so far that even though normative expectations tell us that good quality information is good for us uh, and our democracy, and those who try to bring it to us will be valued. On the other hand, we don't see it in practice. So why are attempts to correct misinformation so limited in their impact? Uh, this was the driving question behind this study. So to answer this question, we tried to delve deep into how our media contexts are shaped. Uh, and we tried to think about this problem in, in this unique way. So as Professor Taneja mentioned, if the context is shaped by, high, by a high amount of choice, people are not only able to discover content of their liking, but they also likely gravitate towards it. And we know from past work that consumption of even entertainment programming, leisurely entertainment programming, can distort audiences' perceptions on important issues. So we extend this line of thinking to suggest that entertainment perhaps underscores how we interface with news and politics throughout the information ecosystem. And we try to argue that political information itself is increasingly consumed with the help of entertainment carriers. So in such high, high competition environments, the challenge is for media owners, which is to be able to appeal to the greatest number of people uh, and to not lose audiences who may otherwise seek more entertaining options elsewhere. So we see that there's a debate between news versus entertainment, but that is often resolved through structures of news as entertainment. So as Professor Taneja highlighted, that there's a decline in news use, but it is often the vehicle of entertainment that brings audiences back into the fold of news programming. So So you can see this across networks, across platforms, and across media. For example, when you see these high-octane debates, talking heads, talking about the later, latest scandal, it is an instance of news as entertainment. Across the spectrum, you do see some subscription to this model based on ideas like spin or framing or bias and so on. These routines are technically aimed at creating identifiable slices of audiences. And in many cases, political parties become the brand through which media organizations come to be identified. So as Professor Taneja mentioned, in the United States, for instance, Fox News caters to a Republican-leaning, right-leaning uh, audience, and MSNBC perhaps does that for the left-leaning ones. So polarization then does not remain an independent symptom. Instead, it adds yet another layer in the news as entertainment paradigm. So how do we think about this? How do we examine context if that's where we think the problem lies? Uh, we use the case of the Indian media and observe misinformation correction in practice in the wild as opposed to in carefully crafted laboratory or experimental spaces. Uh, the first part of this was observing how misinformation is constructed and corrected and if there, in, if there are any gaps that exist over there. Secondly, we studied how, given those gaps, audiences of corrections respond to them. So we examined many, many cases of which I'll take you through a particular one to exemplify the larger pattern that we observed. So health-related misinformation was doing the rounds, especially during the pandemic. One such out of many viral claims suggested that an Ayurvedic medicine was approved as the first evidence-based medicine for COVID-19, and this approval was given by the World Health Organization. The fact checker for their part relied on a series of tweets from the WHO who clarified that they are not they are indeed not in the business of approving drugs. Regarding the efficacy of traditional herbs, the fact checker went on to summarize a bunch of research papers to suggest that so to suggest whether scientific studies supported the claims that were being made. However, if you think more about why such misinformation is compelling in the first place, we find that contextually speaking, Ayurvedic medicine is not thought about in the same way as, as Western medicine is, at least in India. It is extolled as an Indian practice. Even its political renditions are rooted in religious narratives and have been seen as a, as a symbol of resistance against the West. And this narrative is popular. It has found a mention in the prime minister's speeches. It has been broadcast to the public through Doordarshan and other channels. So when 
misinformation is motiva motivated by ideas of cultural supremacy of some kind, it allows rejection of any kind of disputing evidence as an attack on Indian ideals uh, or something adjacent to that, which explains, which kind of explains why it persists. And this is not just limited to health-related misinformation. We see the same pattern in political misinformation as well. For instance, the claim that Nehru was slapped by a godman for insulting Aryans, or that the prime minister was met with protests in Dhaka. Uh, in each case, the fact checker relied on these very technical and scientific measures. For example, they performed a reverse image search. They went through the archives of newspapers so as to be able to debunk the claims convincingly. But these cases, if you dig deeper, also have similar cultural and historical antecedents that we saw in the coronal case. So there's, there's a gap there, right? Um, for the next part of our study, we decided to see how audiences responded to fact checks. Uh, and to nobody's surprise, we encountered a stream of attacks where either side of the political spectrum was attacking each other, whether to say that the fact checker works for the opposition or to say that they are exposing the current government, so well done. Um, even as the fact checker tried to divorce context, this is what we see, that even as the fact checker tried to divorce context from their findings and tried to take a step back and adopt the space of this neutral technocratic arbiter of truth, audiences brought the context right back into the conversation, often with different versions of the same piece of debunked media as evidence. So where does that leave us and what does that imply? So through the case studies, we learn that Political misinformation is consistently rooted in cultural and political cues. That's what makes them compelling. Corrections, on the other hand, rely on technical scientific measures to debunk them. So there's a gap there. Uh, and replies to fact checkers show us that rather than being convinced because there's evidence to prove otherwise, people tend to double down on their prior beliefs, which is backfire effect live in action. All this suggests that perhaps there's a deeper problem like we suspected and fact-checking and misinformation correction interven interventions are not working in exactly the way you would expect them to. So this is because the, the site of competition is not facts, but the larger media contexts where dominance is sought over audiences. The methods that fact-checkers employ or their commitment to democracy don't seem to be determinants of their influence. What seems to persist in our analysis is how media contexts have shaped their audiences. In that case, the fact checker is also seen as a politically motivated figure. Um, as, and as Rick highlighted, fact, check, fact checks are further removed from, the, from people's repertoires, given simply how communities take shape on the internet, uh, which is based on prior interests and algorithms. So unless you're really committed to fact checking, you will likely not see it. However, this is not to say that it's a failure of fact checking and shouldn't exist. It isn't. What we are trying to highlight is public, how public attitudes manifest and how they are shaped by the news media. So essentially, when structures are new structures are motivated by entertainment, it leaves very little room for disbelief when either Marilyn Monroe's iconic images morph to look like an opposition leader's, or when the origins of the image are established with scientific evidence. So access to the public sphere is actively being shaped by the ethos of entertainment as a result of which fact-based journalism, media literacy interventions, and so on are finding very little purchase. And going forward as practitioners or scholars in the field, we have to recognize how cultures of newsmaking ultimately account for the quality of information we get. So any meaningful intervention to disseminate good information, whatever that may be, must attempt to think about at least how it will always be received by audiences as an artifact of its media context. So I'll um, give it over to Professor Taneja. Um, that's all from me. Okay, unmuted now. So, so yeah, so I think, you know, Rick and Sakshi both did a fantastic job of, you know, presenting the studies that we've been working on for the last couple of years and you know I think they're taking good shape but unfortunately you know these studies are telling us that fact checkers are theoretically an ideal solution to misinformation it's like okay there is people are 
because all news is not going through the news media people are like they did before journalism was a thing give news to each other basically people are increasingly doing that on social media whether you think of whatsapp tiktok reels facebook channels youtube whatever you think basically ordinary people are able to give news to each other at massive scale and that creates a problem of misinformation along with bad actors who are utilizing this tendency among people to their advantage but you know theoretically you may think that fact checkers if we have all these bad actors who are spreading misinformation we also have a few good actors who are working very hard to correct misinformation and that should neutralize the effect of these bad actors but what we are seeing is that that's not really happening so i think on this somewhat you know darker note i would like to open this up for questions yeah thank you so much dr taneja and uh, rick and sakshi for the very interesting talk and uh, we are open to questions uh, i would request attendees if there are any questions they can put it on the chat box uh, we would not be able to take uh, a question i mean directly so if anybody is raising their hands on the uh, on the attendee i would request you to type the question uh, instead so by the time i believe they are typing the question i have one question uh, for the speakers of today's session uh, so uh, like one of the premises i'm in for for today's session was you know fact checking because as uh, as the the number of sources the supply of news itself increases like with the you know with the digitalization with social media and everything uh, fact checking becomes more and more important uh, than it has ever been so are there any any uh, now i'm relating this to the other phenomenon where you know indians uh, or many many things in india we are you know learning from the western uh, western uh, 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 countries so are there any similarly in fact checking the processes or the structures the systems involved are there any learnings that that india has taken or you know how has this really evolved you know what are you, you know the learnings or the has there been a learning curve where we learn something from them or it was you know we were better at it and you know there were some learnings from us to the western so if anything uh, in that end because you covered two sides the the indian side and the us side i i don't know like what and the one thing we can say is that i think we have not i mean so when if you saw from our study this problem of fact checking having a very niche presence and a very limited reach among audiences is not uniquely an indian problem it is both it's a western as well as an indian problem and i think it would be fair to say that this idea of independent public facing fact checkers who are trying to correct misinformation at this massive scale on social media is a relatively new phenomenon both for india and the west so in that sense like i think the practices are fairly common and shared so i won't sort of you know be able to differentiate that you know there is a flow of knowledge or there is a transmission of knowledge from the west to the rest which is also not not the most ideal thing in media yeah. regardless i mean you know we we developed doordarshan with such a philosophy that you know these modern technologies of information will help us develop faster and better as a society which which didn't really happen so so i think no on this this is too new a phenomenon to really 
have this kind of an approach but i think in that also for example what sakshi presented that contexts are very unique and maybe what some of our indian fact checkers are doing is that they are technically learning a lot from the west but they are probably not realizing that the playbook in india has to be somewhat different because other context is shaping sort of you know people's appetite for facts and also for misinformation a little differently i don't know i mean happy for sakshi or rick anybody to add more to this uh i think i think you're right there because uh, these phenomena have kind of they have global precedence and they've kind of occurred together so it's hard to say if one is doing it better than the other but uh, what does uh, stand out is the the fact that even fact checkers in in the us or in the west face similar responses similar kind of problems as fact checkers in india do so the kind of discursive analysis that i presented may well be applied to the to american fact checkers you know with a few changes here and there uh, so so that's an issue and that kind of points to the problem that misinformation is a very complex problem and a simple bandaid of like hey here's um here's evidence here's counter evidence uh to disprove your prior beliefs that is not perhaps going to work and we need to confront this in a more nuanced way uh rick would you like to add something i think they covered it all okay all right so there is a audience question about how can media provide solutions to other problems of communal conflicts so i think in some sense communal conflict is just one of the many conflicts that we pointed out here that the idea that you know the the larger context in which the news media and the media in general are embedded and are shaping us is is an attempt to polarize audiences right and communal conflicts at least as they manifest on media are a larger part of the same issue so maybe bringing that closer to our presentation can fact checkers necessarily be effective in correcting communal misinformation or religious misinformation purely on the basis of trying to tell you that this is correct and this is not correct no i don't think that's going to happen i think fact checkers need to take larger cognizance of why communal misinformation has traction i think just adding on to that question was another question from audience which was with regards to the uh, humanitarian crisis uh, with regards to rohingya refugees uh, and also uh, covid 19 basically two instances where uh, fact checking got much more highlighted and you know how uh, misinformation was spreading widely across social media in these two instances so probably that's uh, what is being highlighted uh, in this remark no so i think the larger point here to think about is that do people do even for example these people who sakshi showed are you know combating fact checks that if if they are told by a fact checker that what they are spreading is incorrect and then you know we've seen that they are pretty colorful in their language when they reply so 
for these people does it even matter in the first place that that what is wrong and what is right i think it is more about literally like abusing the power of a microphone or a megaphone that they have in front of them in the form of social media to simply spread their belief spread their ideology so i think what fact checkers are not realizing and which kind of both our studies show together is that who they think they are aiming to correct is not really the audience that is even showing any engagement with them right i mean of course we can't we can only examine people who are engaging with them and who they are reaching on twitter and who they are not we cannot speak for the others you know on whom we don't have this type of behavioral data from the way we have done these studies but at least based on who is engaging what we see is that the engagement is really by people who are already much more entrenched in the kind of information and misinformation that the fact checkers are correcting than the ordinary public who really needs to know what is correct and what is not correct i mean in an ideal world if i am spreading misinformation i am told by a fact checker that you know what you are saying is wrong because the facts speak otherwise then i should simply offer a correction that okay what i said was wrong which is what traditional media traditionally did and still that's right if if times of india published something that was even marginally incorrect the next day's newspaper would have a column of corrections but can we do fact checkers hope the same from people who are spreading misinformation on social media yeah that's a very uh, interesting point and a question at which you left us so uh, i just noticed that one of our uh, program advisory council member mr dipalma is also in the attendees so hello sir and i hope you liked our session today uh meanwhile uh, going to the comments i i saw we have many questions with regards to our program in journalism and uh, with regards to geo institute in general so uh, we will be taking questions on that but before we do that i would like to first like formally thank uh, all uh, three of you like dr tanija uh, sakshi and rick for taking time uh, for the session today uh, it was a very uh, insightful session and i'm sure the audience felt the same so thank you very much and uh, yeah now we would move to the questions on the program so for our other audience members who are not aware uh, geo institute is launching a post graduate program in journalism this year our admissions are already live uh, the admissions uh, uh, platform is open uh, if you are interested to explore more please look at our website uh, you can also give a call uh, to uh, one of our counselors to know more and to look at you know alignment of you know whether this program is suitable for you or not and share it in your uh, network whoever is interested so coming to a few of the questions that we have got with regards to uh, the program so uh, one of our audience members is asking a very pertinent question you know what are the career prospects in journalism uh, and yeah so uh, harsh would you like to take that i am happy to take the career prospects question but you know actually there was this one interesting question by an anonymous attendee yeah how will large yes. language models and image generation ais affect the production of misinformation and fact checking i don't know rick you are probably the ai and the large language model expert amongst us so would you want to offer some thoughts 
I think that's a very pertinent question, especially mm-hmm. since uh, it has just blown up in just the last couple of months. And uh, I think there's it's still an evolving situation and we are just at the beginning. And there are a lot of ways that you can skirt around the filters that are put in place uh, on the interfaces, uh, the public interfaces that are available. But at the same time, you have to understand that it it's not just used for like, it can be misused, but there are an equal number of uh, use cases that are being developed and applications being developed that are using these same language models that can counter that misinformation. So when you scale everything up, I think um, it's essentially going to look quite the same, like there's going to be this tug of war on the volume of corrective information that should be produced to counter the misinformation. But as of now, I think this is uh, quite difficult to say like how it's going to shape up but it's good, definitely going to be interesting and uh, especially uh, so chat gpt itself uh, doesn't have uh, like it can't directly access uh, the internet sources but you can create applications that can use uh, internet sources and i think bard actually can cite those sources. So that is, in fact, another interesting aspect where language models can actually help because it also gives you the original source of information and it can also tweak the language and the tone, which can make uh, corrective information more amenable to people who are prone to fall prey. So yeah, that's just my two cents. So no, and actually I, I invoked that because somebody asked about career options and I would say, you know, that's a career option right there that ultimately a lot of computer scientists can create these language models and can, you know, demonstrate the possibilities of, you know, AI and machine learning in interesting ways. But actually we would need experts in in media experts, in news audiences, experts in studying the public and public attitudes to to be able to sort of answer your question of, you know, whether these things will be effective in this particular domain. And I think a journalist or someone training to be a journalist could totally like train themselves enough to understand what these models are and how and why they work or don't work and be very useful to news, to media and to society, right? So, so that's one you know, example of an innovative career option, but we could scale back. So at the most basic a journalism degree can teach you how to you know, be a better judge of what should be in the news, how to then take raw information, make it into the news, and how to disseminate it the most efficiently and for the maximum number of people for whom it is intended. So, you know, the basic skills of reporting, writing that you could take to any kind of newsroom, whether it's a traditional legacy media organization like a newspaper, TV channel, a digital outlet, a news outlet that relies on social media. But then you could also think of not just language models, but a lot of interesting new technologies that are becoming relevant for news organizations when it comes to news delivery. So think of, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, this whole idea of creating immersive media. So I think ultimately, if news wants to become more relevant and more cutting edge in its delivery, I think news can, I mean, so go back to our topic, like think about it hypothetically, if fact checkers could use some amount of augmented reality 
to convey misinformation corrections would would people find that use of rich media more convincing it's just a very wild thought but that's where someone could make a career out of that you could and the general i and so when is the whole idea of making learning how to make content and make news but the other thing that a program like this would teach is how to analyze the news and that skill would actually prepare you for a lot of you know jobs in think tanks policy institutions even organizations like you know google facebook and similar other companies that for whom news is a very important area they may not be directly in the business of making news and providing news to people but they recognize that they are the biggest intermediaries when it comes to how people get the news so a lot of the times they are held responsible for all the misinformation that is circulating out there so they want to all they want people who understand news information and misinformation and people enough to to be able to deal with the reality that you know ultimately they are the biggest carriers of news and information and misinformation and they are often held responsible for it so that whole area where you deal with sort of media and technology policy and analysis is another interesting career option then you know if you are more interested in on the business side of things on the programming and strategy side of things you could look at product management within news organizations if you like audio and video production you could basically think of digital content creation as a career area so i am trying to speak of the more non traditional career options here the traditional ones of course are you know indian media is still growing news audiences in india are still growing unlike most of the western world where you know news is in a steady state like we i spoke in the beginning that there is a lot of mistrust in news organizations and people are tuning out of the news increasingly but that's not the case in india yeah are there you. any other questions that we so there was a term coined by someone in that indies uh, so i'll just quote the question it says what is digital humanities uh, i'm not sure if it was uh, used in today's uh, talk but if you would like to share some thoughts on that uh i think i mean it's not really a question that's most relevant to this session or i mean it will it will get into now first i'll have to go into like what is humanities and you know okay then what is digital humanities i don't know if either rick or sachi want to tackle it i am happy to let them but you know it's going to take a while <laughs> to get into everything i mean we can give an example let's say that you are studying english literature and you want to actually use some digital methods to analyze the text of a of amitav ghosh's novels and find some interesting patterns and present them visually so traditionally how you would do it is that you would read the text very closely and you would do some kind of a cultural analysis some kind of a social analysis around you know why has amitav ghosh made certain choices in his text and what they reflect but you could also throw that text into some machine learning models do some interesting try to discover some patterns so that is 
So if you start doing that in addition to the traditional analysis, that would be digital humanities. So using digital methods in the humanities. I don't know if that's helpful to the anonymous attendee, whoever you are. Thank you for the question. Okay, we have another question uh, with regards to admission. So somebody says, uh, my age is 63. Am I overage for a media studies course at Geo Institute? I, I would, the short answer is no. It's never exactly. too late to learn. And I don't think, we have any restrictions. We don't right? have. We, we don't have any restrictions as such. Yeah. In fact, our uh, you know we always propagate the uh, the objective of learning for life. You know, learning never stops basically. And I would like to ask the attendee to get in touch with our admissions team. Uh, there is a number, uh, a call center number on our website. Give them a call. Talk to them and. If you are interested, do apply. Someone is interested in understanding the role of Facebook in willing elections. Now, I don't know. I think like that's too broad a question. You know, it's. I think maybe the general point I would offer is that, you know, Assigning cause and effect is, is extremely hard when it comes to social phenomena. So in some sense, like people accessing information on Facebook is a social phenomenon. And even elections are a social phenomenon. So you are trying to sort of assign a cause or you are trying to assess a cause and effect relationship between these two social phenomena, which are both very complicated, multi-layered, and need to be unpacked. So, and even, so think about it, even when you access information on Facebook, that doesn't happen in vacuum. So, so you, in an in Indian context, you often hear that, you know, okay, BJP is very powerful on Facebook. They have, but so are they winning elections because they are BJP and they can mobilize all channels very well, including Facebook? Or are they winning elections because Facebook plays a role in winning elections? Nobody can really, you know, tell the two apart that which one is the real reason. So, so I think like, you know, the answer to that question is really like, yes, Facebook is too important to ignore, but it's probably not the only reason or the main reason. Or the question is largely about social media. So that would be the answer that social media is too important to ignore, but it's not the only you know, reason. So I think we've yeah. addressed everything. Yeah, we have covered all the questions and I think we have already uh, overshot the time of the today's masterclass as well. So uh, I guess uh, we will now close the session for today. Uh, in case the attendees, you know, you have any questions uh, that you would like to share with our team uh, with regards to today's masterclass or with regards to any of our programs, uh, with regards to admissions to the Institute, do reach out to us, uh, check our website, all the contact information, uh, you know, through email or phone, uh, everything is available there. Uh, do reach out to us and we will uh, respond back to you. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Dr. Taneja, Rick and Sakshi for today's session. Uh, it was very insightful and uh, they're very uh, good for all the attendees today. Uh, thank you to all the audience members uh, for their continuous support and belief in us. You know, it continues to motivate us to come up with new masterclasses uh, time and again. 
Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the team at Geo Institute, so Deepthi Radhima, uh, Mayuri, Himan, Shura, Kesar, and all others who have worked very diligently to bring this masterclass for everyone today. So with that, thank you everyone and have a nice evening. Yeah, goodbye. Thank you. Done.